Ömer Seyfeddin and Mehmet Akif, who earlier today in uh, President uh, Mehmet Bulut's presentation was mentioned as one of the earliest graduates of this university when it was still an agricultural college and veterinary school. Ömer Seyfeddin is, of course, I mean, my Turkish audience would be very familiar with him. He was a very major proponent of Turkism, as against Ottomanism, uh, an out-and-out -out Turkish nationalist, a modernist Turkish nationalist, I would say, in the early 20th century, basically writing between, let's say, 1910 and 1920, that decade. And Mehmet Akif Ersoy, does he really need any introduction? He was a leading Islamist and moderate reformer around the same time as Ömer Seyfeddin, who went on to compose two iconic works of Turkish literature in 1915-1916, the hymn to the martyrs of Gallipoli, Çanakkale Şehitlerine, and then in 1921, uh, what has come to be the Turkish national anthem. So, I'm going to be looking as quickly as I can in the space of 18 to 20 minutes at their intersecting, overlapping, and yet maybe partially different reactions to the challenge of colonialism at that time. And I may be making some perhaps a little bit iconoclastic statements about Mehmet Akif in particular, uh, whose degree of Turkish nationalism, I think, or the extent to which, together with his Islamism, he was willing to accommodate Turkish nationalism at that time, has probably been underestimated to some extent by his more purely Islamist readers. The challenge of uh, uh, imperialism and colonialism, both are extremely aware of it, uh, totally sensitive to it. Um, one of Ömer Seyfeddin's most famous works is a story called Primo, a Turkish boy. I'm using my own translations, by the way, because I've translated something like nearly 20 Ömer Seyfeddin stories, as well as the hymn to the martyrs of Gallipoli into English, and I have yet to publish these as a kind of companion volume, I hope, to a study that I'm writing precisely on the subject, the intersections of these others. In Primo, a Turkish boy, the hero, Kenan, who in the face of Italy's attack on invasion and occupation of Tripoli, Libya, in 1911, is going through a cathartic awakening and a transformation from his previously cosmopolitan European identity into Turkish nationalism. He has been a Freemason, a great admirer of European civilization, you might say a slavish admirer of European civilization. He's married, he's been educated in Europe, married an Italian woman, his boss's daughter in Gavur Izmir, uh, and, uh, uh, and then they have settled in Salonika before the Balkan Wars. This is on the eve of the Balkan Wars. And now what is happening is Italy is invading uh, uh, Tripoli, and this has an immense mental and psychological impact on Kenan, who goes through this profound identity change. Walking up and down the Salonican waterfront, uh, one September evening, he is thinking to himself about <coughs> Europeans in the service of humanity, he grumbles to himself, certain acts by Europeans to which he had previously attached no great significance or had even regarded as quite natural kept suddenly 
surfacing in his mind. First, he thinks of French colonialism in Africa. Then, then, uh, then he switches uh, uh, to the British Empire and its presence in uh, Africa. All the violence, the domination, the hypocrisy, the slaughters, the opium war, uh, China, etc., he pours out in an internal monologue of something like two pages, which, if you did not know that it was written by a Turkish nationalist, with here and there telltale signs of his Ottoman Turkish identity, might very well have been written by a Marxist anti-imperialist of the Second International. And it is, this is actually no coincidence, because, of course, these young Turk circles, publishing Türk Yurdu and then Halka Doğru in the early 20th century, actually had considerable overlaps and were intellectual to some extent partially fed by the Marxist anti-imperialism era, a leading theorist of the Second International, Alexander Helfand, known as Parvus, was actually writing the economics column in, the, in their leading theoretical uh, uh, periodical, Türk Yurdu. So it was not any con We have to think of the early 20th century intellectual environment. Imperialism and colonialism is on the agenda of many kinds of anti-imperialists and anti-colonialists, and there is a considerable degree of intellectual interaction uh, among them. Um, these two pages from Primo are, as I said, they also contain various references. How do I turn this off and switch to my other text? I'm sorry, but I mean, uh, no. This is this is still the same story. How I how do I get out of this text entirely? Can anybody technical help me? I I, I want to I want to switch to another text. Can I turn it off? Can I turn it off? Can I turn it off? Can Yine bu dosyanın içerisinde. Another file. Yes. Another file. <sighs> Bundan çıkmak istiyorum. Tamam. Right. I want to switch to. İki defa. Oh. I'm sorry about uh, uh, this technical mess up. Okay. This is better. Thank you. Size gene ihtiyacım olabilir. Um, so this is on the eve. Well, this is right after Italy's invasion of Tripoli. And on the eve of the Balkan Wars. The Masafeddin actually himself fights in the Balkan Wars, is captured by the Greek army during the siege of Yanina, and is returned to Istanbul as part of the prisoner exchange after the Second War of 1913 is finally over. In 1914, he publishes his story Mahdi, or the Mahdi, Mehdi in Turkish, um, five or six Turkish Ottoman persons are in a train compartment that is leaving Ceres for Istanbul, probably never to return, because the Ottoman Empire has lost virtually all its previous Balkan territories. Uh, and at first, they are, there is a deep silence that prevails uh, among them. Uh, it is a kind of 
stony, sorrowful, sorrowing silence that Ömer Seyfeddin says prevails among all peoples of the Muslim lands at that time. And a little time passes and they enter into conversation. There is one among them is a fat gentleman with a black Alla Franca beard and new traveling clothes who launches on this long diatribe against, in fact, an Islamic identity and the state and cultural circumstances of Muslim societies at that time. My son, if it is anything to be proud of, I too can without any effort be as much of a Muslim and a zealot as you. I graduated from the Imperial School of Civil Administration, meaning the Mülkiye. I've served as a deputy governor and then a governor for 18 years. Let me tell you here and now that Muslims have no right to exist. And Turks will never again be able to come here. There is no need to hide here from you certain truths that I would not be able to pronounce in Turkey because we are here on the territory of a free and civilized government, meaning Greece. Neither you nor the respected Hoca Efendi over there would be able to find any ancient form of justice here capable of asking for me to be hanged or to have my head cut off if you were to accuse me of atheism or of going against Islam. He goes on, and basically what he preaches is that Muslim societies have ended up as being colonized basically because of Islam. That is to say, this is, what this is, is 19th century European Orientalism on Islam as a backward and primitive system of faith because of its internal fatalism and other factors now imported and internalized by an Ottoman Turkish administrator, what we are facing is imported and internalized and adopted Eurocentrism or Orientalism from the mouth of an Alla Franca Ottoman Turkish administrator. Uh, so they listen to this diatribe, the authorial voice, the author who is present in the train compartment says, this was a passionate dogmatic atheist. I was about to advise him not to be swept along by his emotions and his dogmatism, etc. when somebody mentions the word Mehdi and talk turns around, the conversation turns around to whether a Mahdi might arrive to save Islam, to save all of Islam. Some of them make jokes about the possibility of a Mahdi arriving. The Hoca Efendi, this venerable old man who has been apparently dozing off in one of, uh, corner of the compartment, at this point opens his eyes, straightens up, and starts talking by saying, so you are laughing at the Mahdi, eh? And our author, Ömer Seyfeddin, the modernist Turkish nationalist, is at first uh, anxious, that worried that he's going to hear a very dogmatic, very medieval, very backward kind of lecture from this Hoca Efendi. I turn my head to the window in order not to have to hear the absurd idiocies that this senile fanatic, inclined to proving through science that the earth was flat, resting like a tray on the horns of an ox that was itself standing on a fish, would be spewing forth on the question of the Mahdi. Here we have, what we have here is unionist anti-Islamism. 
a classic expression of the Ittahadist, the Unionist uh, anti-Islamism. All Islam, all advocates of Islam are taken to be backward, fatalistic, ignorant, uh, sunken medieval scholasticism, etc., precisely on the same lines as the fat gentleman that has spoken previously. But it turns out that the Hoca Efendi has something very, very different to say. I've probably overstepped my time already, but what the Hoca Efendi says is this. There is never going to be a single Mahdi for all of Islam. Instead, just as the Quran puts it, to each people will be sent a guide. Each nation in this world of nations will receive its own guide and find its own liberator. Against imperialism and colonialism, Different nations have to wage their own fight, guided by their own Mahdis. Not a single Mahdi, but individual national and nationalist Mahdis for each country, each society. We Turks, and the Hoca Efendi here begins speaking as we Turks, not as we Muslims, but as we Turks. We Turks must wage or our own fight against imperialism and colonialism in conformity with our uh, national circumstances, conditions, and constraints. And only and only when all Islamic nations and societies have succeeded in liberating themselves in this way, Will we be then able to start speaking, perhaps, of an Islamic international confronting a Christian international? Only then and never before that. He expresses belief that that time will also come, but this is his main message. The author, the authorial voice, Omar Seyfeddin himself, sitting in the compartment, is stunned by the speech. It comes to him like a new revelation. Then there happens something else. A, a, a Greek enters the compartment. I can manage it in five minutes. A Greek enters the compartment and he starts insulting the all the Muslim Turks present. So once again, they fall into that stony silence characteristic of Islamic societies at this time. And the story ends with these lines. And my gaze was returning again and again to fix itself on the white turban that kept shining like a distant reflection of a bright dawn of hope and deliverance, the old Hoja's great and radiant head that kept nodding in a wakeful absorption. In the course of the story, there has been a tremendous transformation in the attitude of the authorial voice to Islam. He has switched from a purely negative kind of rejection to a, an utterly new perception of a national kind of Islam that might play a very significant role in Ottoman Turkey's fight against imperialism and colonialism. What is the historical context? The histor historical context is obviously the Balkan Wars, which we know as historians to have led to a huge switch in the Committee of Union and Progress's attitude towards religion. Up to 1912, they are very negative. Uh, they are considerably anti-clerical, precisely along the lines described by advocated by the fat young gentleman in this story. But 
faced with the problem of mass mobilization against Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Montenegro, it is, as Fikred Adener has put it in a brilliant article some years ago, they realize that nationalism is impossible without Islam, impossible without religion. They have to find a way of enlisting Islam, enlisting popular religion in, in the service of the nationalist cause. Mind you, they are looking for a subordinate, useful, and tolerable form of Islam. It is not the case that they have dropped or relinquished all their prejudices against uh, uh, Islam. They are looking for a form of Islam that can be tamed and domesticated by Turkish nationalism. And now, I come to my all too quick closing statement about Mehmet Akif in this context. Where does he stand? Where does he, where does he position himself between Islam and nationalism? As I've already revealed my hand at the outset, he has more Turkish nationalism to him than is often realized. He was a member of the Committee of, the, of Union and Progress. He was himself an Itarchi. He was actually uh, a member of the Teşkilat-ı Mahsusa, the special arm of uh, the Unionist Party. And at the time the Gallipoli battles, the Gallipoli campaign was taking place, he was actually in the Ottoman Empire's Arab provinces, probably sent there on anti-British, anti-espionage missions, of course he spoke fluent Arabic, to uh, engage in a struggle to prevent the Arabs, the Arabic tribes, from switching over to the side of uh, British imperialism. So he was politically very, very engaged with the Unionist Party. Earlier, he had been in opposition to Abdul Hamid II as an autocrat. And against him, he had sided with the Young Turks, and this is where the affinity comes from. He returns from the Arab provinces, and he is given a tour of the Gallipoli battlefields, and then he sits down to write his great hymn to the martyrs of Gallipoli. He never once uses the word Turk. Neither does he in the Turkish national anthem, for, for that matter. The word Turk or Turkish Turkish language, the Turks, etc., these are never mentioned, but there are subtle hints that he is, in fact, speaking about Turkey's Muslims and nobody else. When he says, for example, in the national anthem, my heroic race, he cannot possibly be kahraman urkum in Turkish, my heroic race. He cannot possibly be referring to the entire Islamic ummah as his heroic race. Very clearly, he is referring to a Turkey-rooted Turkish and yet Muslim ethnicity. When he says, ben ezelden beridir hür yaşadım, hür yaşarım, I have lived in uh, freedom and continue to live in freedom from time immemorial, again, he cannot possibly be referring to the entire Islamic ummah. Very clearly, he is referring to Ottoman Turkey, which has never been colonized, while all other Islamic countries or states are in a colonial situation at this time. So freedom here is actually freedom from colonialism. So without ever using the word Turk, he finds all kinds of ways to subtly define himself as Turkish. And I come to my conclusion. There is a passage, a very famous passage, in the hymn to the martyr of Gallipoli, where he is now addressing the fallen Turkish soldier, which he does not call the Turkish soldier. 
but just the fallen soldier. And he dreams up all kinds of things that he could do to sacralize this fallen soldier's memory, which again he does not name in ethnic terms. But there are some crucial lines. Such is your greatness that your blood saves God's unity. Ne büyüksün ki kanın kurtarıyor tevhidi. Bedrin aslanları ancak bu kadar şanlıydı. The heroes, the lions of the Battle of Bedr in the Prophet's times could have been only this glorious. And then comes a more emphatic statement. He is saying, if I could do this, if I could do this to your tomb, to your grave, your tombstone, it wouldn't suffice, it would not be enough. And in the process he says, if I were to place the Kaaba as your tombstone, and he goes on to say, he goes on to add various other uh, uh, superlatives, even then I wouldn't have done anything to perpetuate your memory. Now what is this? Is this just rhetoric? Is this just poetic exaggeration? The Kaaba is a symbol of the supreme symbol of universal Islam, of the Islamic Ummah. And he is actually saying, if I were to take the Kaaba, if I were to bring it here, and if I were to place it at the head of your grave, even then I wouldn't have done enough to commemorate your memory. For generation students have been perhaps thinking these lines without reflecting on it enough. Here there is a certain overlap between nationalism and Islam that is for the first time being formulated in this way in Mehmed Akif's poetry. In effect you could say that in response to Ömer Seyfeddin's kind of challenge he is coming up with the idea of an Islam in alliance with and willing to share the same political objectives as Turkish nationalism. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Bekta. You raised important uh, points that hopefully we'll pick up on them uh, during discussion. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Masad, Dr. Joseph Masad. And the title of his speech is Liberalism versus Liberation, the Arab World at Present. Dr. Masad. May I turn this off? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to Siga and to Dr. Al-Aryan for inviting me and including me um, in this important uh, conference. Both liberation and liberalism derive from the words liberty and freedom. But in the colonial and post-colonial Arab world, as elsewhere, the two terms have had varied histories, goals, and achievements. Indeed, one could divide their intellectual, cultural, political, and economic effects between the periods immediately following independence in the 1940s through the mid to late 1970s, and the period between the 1980s and the present. The first period was informed by the ideals of national liberation, which dominated popular political movements and elite intellectual production, while the ideals of liberalism inform the second period and dominate the fields of elite intellectual production and political activism. Are these two ideologies mutually exclusive? Are they compatible or combinable with one another? Or, as their histories seem to reveal, are they inimical and adversarial to one another? I will attempt to delineate these differences in what follows in an attempt to clarify the shifts that they have made in the lives of the peoples of the region. During the 1950s through the 1970s, Arab intellectuals and political movements supported the project of liberation and colonialism, from colonialism and the achievement not only of political but also of economic independence. 
The language of national liberation became the rallying cry of recently decolonizing regimes, spearheaded by President Jamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, but extending to Syria and Iraq, and overtaking even conservative regimes in Tunisia and Jordan, and anti-colonial movements extending from Algeria to Palestine to Oman and the rest of the Gulf region and reaching the Western Sahara. The goal of economic democracy viewed as partial redistribution of wealth and state-led development aimed at closing the income gap and ending poverty was always paramount during this period. However, gradually following the 1967 war and increasingly by the mid to late 1970s, the principles of national liberation were delegitimized in favor of a new language characterized by liberalism and what was often called ideological pragmatism wherein national liberation came to be depicted as idealistic and that it had brought about political, economic, military, and human disasters and defeats rather than progress and political democracy across the Arab world. Liberalism, in contrast, promised and promises to bring about personal freedom, regional peace, and individual prosperity, as well as, they tell us, political democracy, viewed through the lens of free elections of the legislative and executive branches. Liberalism dismisses economic democracy as contrary to the neoliberal freeing of opportunities for personal enrichment, even if some liberal critiques uh, even if some liberals critique the excesses of neoliberal economics and seek to mitigate their effects. Liberalism has become so popular that not only formerly leftist Arab regimes, erstwhile leftist intellectuals, and left political movements adopted it, but even erstwhile liberation movements like the PLO did as well. If the project for national liberation believed in popular plebiscitary political democracy as the companion to economic democracy, Liberalism insists on electoral political democracy that can ensure economic dictatorship in so far as the market should dictate economic policy and not the people or the state institutions representing them. The national liberationist commitment to political and economic projects based on the principles of national liberation was not unique to the Arab world. Such projects were shared with many of the decolonizing countries in Asia and Africa from the 1950s through the 1970s. Neither was the adoption of the values of Western liberalism, which begins to dominate the Arab world in the late 1970s onwards, an isolated phenomenon, but one, one that was also shared across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, let alone Eastern Europe after 1990. The concept of independence had become the most important notion in the colonial world, including in the Arab world since World War I, and in some cases since the late 19th century, especially in the case of Egypt. In addition to independence, the notion of liberation, whose current use is more recent, defined the struggles, both material and rhetorical, of the colonies during World War I and in European countries fighting Nazi occupation in the course of World War II, and yet again of the colonized in Asia and Africa fighting against European colonial occupation during and after World War II, many of whose movements came to adopt the term liberation in their very names. The two notions of independence and national liberation were advanced to end all aspects of colonialism, political, economic, and cultural, and began to be articulated in increasingly global terms at the United Nations. They had become part of the anti-colonial zeitgeist and would reach their apogee in the many United Nations resolutions and debates that raged in the corridors of the UN in the 1960s. The adoption by the United Nations General Assembly of Resolution 1514 in December 1960, titled Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples, was a watershed event. Indeed, the resolution became possible as a result of the Asian African Conference at Bandung in the mid-50s. In 1966, the UN's adoption of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights crowned these important achievements. The advent of economic independence would be advanced by what came to be articulated as Arab socialism in Egypt, but also in Algeria, Syria, and Iraq of the 1960s and 70s. The convening of the Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung in the mid-50s and of the non-aligned movement soon after 
followed in the mid-60s by the Tricontinental Conference in Cuba, globalized this quest against colonial and neocolonial powers. The project in the Arab context would lead to an attempt at unity and federations between Arab countries, attempts that were also ongoing between sub-Saharan African countries led by Ghana's Nkrumah and the recently decolonizing Caribbean nations of the West Indies as well. While the project for federation and unity would be fought tooth and nail by the United States and was defeated in all three contexts by 1962 due to a combination of imperial and internal factors, the creation of a state capitalism that called itself Arab socialism proceeded apace with impressive economic and political results that aimed at delinking the local economies from imperial machinations. The presence of the Eastern Bloc was also most helpful in this regard in staving off, for a while, attempts at imperial restoration of the status quo ante, which, however, would ultimately fail. Beginning with the anti-Mossadegh coup d'etat and the restoration of the Shah in Iran in 1953, the overthrow of President Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954, and the overthrow of Prime Minister Suleiman Nabulsi in Jordan in 1957, imperial coups would overthrow in the mid-1960s Indonesia's Sukarno, Ghana's Nkrumah, and Congo's Lumumba. The attempt to overthrow Nasser would falter though Israel would deal the coup de grace to his regime with its invasion and defeat of the Egyptian army in 1967. His death in 1970 marked the beginning of the end of the era of independence and national liberation. During the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, we find that not only did the Arab so-called socialist economies measured by gross domestic product and workers' productivity, growth in real wages, rise of education level, among others, not only did they skyrocket to unprecedented levels compared to the non-socialist Arab countries, but also that infant mortality declined measurably. Socialized health care for the population at large was now available and increased life expectancy. More equal income distribution was achieved in addition to the essential land reform programs and investment in heavy industry that transformed the local economies in unprecedented ways. But not only were improvements in the economic sphere based on economic independence from colonial control accomplished, but also the salience of political and cultural commitments to national liberation would be articulated by a wide array of intellectuals and artists, which were reflected in novels, cinema, music, painting, drama, poetry, as well as a rewriting of Arab and Islamic history from a liberationist and revolutionary angle. Indeed, the historical rewriting had begun in earnest since the late 19th century, but it would acquire a revolutionary and liberationist spirit it had not had before the 1950s. The works of Hussein Murua, Tayyip Tizini, Abdullah Al Arawi, Mahdi Amil, Samir Amin, Anwar Abdul Malik, even the early Muhammad Amara and the late Abbas Mahmoud Al Aqad, among others, exemplify this. Concerned with political and economic independence, intellectuals were also interested in presenting an Arab and Islamic history liberated from colonial Orientalism. The alliance between the post-independence armies with the class of professionals, technocrats, small capital holders, and small landowners in places like Egypt, Syria, and Iraq would be, despite many limitations, as critics have shown since, a productive one in terms of defining national liberation as independence from colonial, political, and economic control and cultural diktat. These achievements were made despite the ongoing imperialist threat and the situation of war with Israel, which resulted in large military budgets, but not at the expense of sacrificing liberationist goals. With the rise of neoliberalism in the 1970s and its consolidation in the 1980s onwards, all this would change economically, but also politically and culturally. The change would begin in Egypt and coincide with the country's simultaneous surrender to imperial, to imperial sponsorship economically and politically. That the Camp David Accords would be the document that formalized this transformation was hardly coincidental. It is in that context, and with the waning influence and subsequent disintegration of the Soviets, that the same militaries who had played a progressive role committed to national liberation in the previous period switched alliances to the new local economic elites 
a new class of liberal intellectuals and their imperial sponsor. The Western, Israeli, and Saudi war against Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser and anti-imperialist Arab socialism and nationalism required the birth of a new liberal intelligentsia. While an important liberal intelligentsia had emerged during the British occupation of Egypt, it never dominated popular or political movements and activism. The re-emergence on the scene in the late 50s and, the late and, and in the 1960s of liberal intellectuals in the non-socialist Arab countries was part of the American-sponsored cultural Cold War of the period. The US financed intellectuals and their publications across the, wor across the world for the anti-communist and anti-socialist liberal imperial crusade that also targeted anti-imperialist third world nationalisms. This was part and parcel of the Eisenhower Doctrine, which the Americans inaugurated in 1957 to, interve to intervene militarily and in every other way in the Middle East to safeguard it, allegedly, against the Soviet Union. These intellectuals and their publications exalted the virtues of the liberal West against Soviet and non-Soviet forms of communism and socialism and attacked Nasserist Arab nationalism. In the post-1967 war period, this liberal class of intellectuals expanded but was initially confined to the Egyptian Sadatist intelligentsia, whose main aim was to combat Nasserism in both its socialist and its nationalist aspects and to promote capitalist neoliberalism manifest through Sadat's economic policy of infitah and pro-Americanism in foreign policy. As the new century dawned, the Egyptian example became widely generalized across the entire Arab world. The 1970s Egyptian liberals, allied with the neo neoliberal Sadat regime, sang the praises of American power and imperialist capitalist penetration of their country and pushed for full surrender to Israel under the banner of peace. They insisted that Israel should be forgiven all its sins and that allying Egypt with Israel and the U.S. would bring about economic and political benefits to Egyptians. The argument had it that the state of war with Israel is what drained state resources while peace would bring about a profitable dividend that would enrich all Egyptians. The Egyptian Muslim Brothers, whose liberal transformation and disavowal of violence in the 1970s allowed them a seat at the Sadatist table, joined the political contest on the side of the liberal secularists against the Nasserist political and economic legacy and in favor of neoliberal capitalism. While the Sadatist liberals were initially condemned and excommunicated across the Arab world, their and the, the regime's alliance with the US and Israel would bring not prosperity, but enormous poverty to most Egyptians and destroy whatever achievements in education and healthcare and personal income the pre-liberal Nasserist order had achieved. The only thing that increased and became more advanced in this liberal-supported neoliberal Egypt was increased impoverishment of millions of Egyptians who lost even the possibility of an economic future, except for the hundreds of thousands initially, later upwards of four million Egyptians whose employment was subcontracted to neighboring countries in Libya, Jordan, Iraq, and the Gulf states, while tens of millions of Egyptians languished at home in dire poverty. Economic prosperity did come to a small business class and to, to the intelligentsia with which they were allied. Soon, and by the late 1980s, this political and economic line that the Egyptian liberals pushed for, let alone the international alliances they favored, would be adopted wholesale by a new class of Palestinian, Iraqi, and to a much more limited extent, Algerian intellectuals, who had until then been solid anti-imperial leftists and socialists. After 2000, Syrian liberal intellectuals would join in. In this vein, West, West Bank and Gaza-based Palestinian intellectuals pushed for a two-state solution that would grant the West Bank and Gaza an independent state at the expense of diaspora Palestinians and at the expense of Palestinian citizens of Israel, whose rights these intellectuals, under the sponsorship of the Palestine Liberation Organization, wanted to barter for an independent state granted exclusively to the one-third of the Palestinian people that lives in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Indeed, many began to predict that the so-called U.S.-sponsored peace process, which they supported, would transform the West Bank and Gaza into what they called a new Singapore, a neoliberal economic miracle of sorts that would transform the lives of these Palestinians at the expense of the rest. <laughs> 
Once the PLO adopted this line of thinking fully, Palestinian liberal intellectuals became advisors, consultants, negotiators, and ministers in the Palestinian Authority and its business class partners and brought about more massive poverty across the West Bank and Gaza, the erosion of international support for Palestinian rights, and multiplied the forces of repression of the Palestinians by adding the Palestinian Authority security forces to the Israeli occupation army. This has led to the squandering of Palestinian political and economic achievements during the first Palestinian uprising or Antifada. Simultaneous with the rise of this liberal intellectual class among Palestinians, the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait unleashed a new class of Iraqi liberals who are allied with American imperial geostrategic interests and who immediately called in the name of democracy and the end of dictatorship for an imperial invasion of Iraq which cost the lives and livelihoods of untold millions and destroyed the entire country while enriching this class of comprador intellectuals and the new and old business classes they serve. Indeed, many of them went into the service or into service for the U.S. occupation of the country and the ensuing sectarian regime it established. Iraqi liberals were the first Arab liberals to call openly for an imperial invasion of their country, though after the so-called Arab Spring, Syrian liberals, secularists and Islamists alike, would call on NATO to also invade their country to end the Assad dictatorship, which had already instituted neoliberal reforms that resulted in the impoverishment of the Syrian countryside. In addition to the decline in all the economic indicators that showed huge imperial, or rather showed huge improvements under Arab socialism, the new era of neoliberalism reversed all these indicators drastically, including the achievement in education and healthcare, but also in terms of real wages and workers' productivity and GDP, all of which declined between the early 1980s and the present. The new class of Arab liberal intellectuals continued to speak of pragmatism and liberalism as the ideological goals and to rewrite the Arab socialist experience as a political dictatorship that only led to failure. If national liberation in the socialist period concerned itself with the questions of economic development, eliminating poverty, reducing income disparities, anchoring collective identities in a progressive vision of, of history, the new liberalism would articulate its goals in terms of individual, not collective identities, individual political rights, not collective economic rights, and in condemning the history of the past and re reinterpreting it as a liberal failure rather than as something that could be mobilized for a progressive future. The military defeats at the hands of Israel and the lack of liberal political rights and the active political repression of the opposition during the socialist period were now depicted not as failures of political strategy and planning and juxtaposed to the expansion of economic rights and economic development, but rather as cultural failures for which an anti-democratic an anti -democratic Arab culture or even an anti-democratic Islam itself was to blame as famously put by someone like Sadiq Jalal Lahum. In contrast, Islamist liberal thinkers explained the political repression of regime opponents and the defeat of 1967 as resulting from the distance taken from Islam rather than from proximity to it, as the liberals had argued. Both secular and Islamist liberals insisted on the cultural factor as the causative one that led to the military defeat, excluding the major imperial war against third world leftist regimes unleashed during that period. In the case of Egypt, secular and Islamist liberals had opposed Nasser's land reform programs early on in the 1950s and his later socialist measures. Nasser's tenure, as became the case with the Ba'ath rule in Syria and Iraq and the FLN rule in Algeria, their achievement, Nasser's tenure and achievement was now reduced in liberal rhetoric to nothing more than the denial of liberal political rights to secular and Islamist liberals and to communists and royalists, which of course the regime did repress. To be sure, the new secular liberal intelligentsia and liberal and human rights advocates came to be linked economically to the myriad non-governmental organizations funded by the US and the EU, the, the European Union, with Islamist liberal intellectuals linked to organizations that were privately funded by businessmen or by this or that Gulf country. 
These foreign-funded secular non-governmental associations advancing a liberal rights agenda and the foreign-funded non-governmental charitable Islamist service organizations that stepped in to replace the declining and, contra and contracting state sector, which had been defunded under neoliberalism, constitute today the new local civil society. The new liberal era has done away with the erstwhile vocabulary and goals of national liberation and began to articulate the agendas of individual rights and political democracy that the human rights industry, which had arisen in the US and Europe in the 1970s, has been pushing. Intellectuals from across the Arab world joined the effort, abandoning old leftist, communist, Nasserist, and Islamist positions that supported national liberation and adopted the much more profitable pro-US and pro-Israel liberal line politically and the neoliberal economic order being globalized. It is with this as background that Arab liberals, secularists, and Islamists among them emerged during the so-called Arab Spring of 2011 as leaders of the popular revolts of Egypt and Tunisia, but also of Syria, Libya, Bahrain, and Yemen. In Egypt and Tunisia, and earlier in Algeria and Palestine, the infighting between secular liberals and Islamist liberals was over their principled commitment to political democracy and free elections, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. While the Islamists proved their serious commitments in word and deed once they won elections in Palestine, Egypt, and Tunisia, the secular liberals abandoned their commitment to free elections and free speech and freedom of assembly the moment the Islamists won the elections, as happened in Algeria, in the West Bank, and in Egypt. In the telling case of Tunisia, the liberal Islamists, mainly a Nahda party, and secularists in fighting amongst themselves brought about a modus operandi that led to the partial restoration of the Ancien Regime. In Egypt, the secularist liberals were transformed into outright fascists overnight and allied themselves openly with the Mubarakist forces, both in government, the military, and the business sector against the liberal and neoliberal Muslim Brotherhood, which was only able during its brief stint in power to ally itself with the Mubarakist army, which ended up toppling its government. They argued, this is the secular liberals, they argued tireless, tirelessly and still argue that supporting a military coup against the elected and liberal Muslim Brotherhood and the massive massacres that the coup authorities committed, that these were the epitome of liberalism and the restoration of a liberal order. Unlike the national liberationists who delivered on their promises of free universal education and health care, partial redistribution of wealth to close the economic gap, increased productivity, and increased GDP, the neoliberal regimes that the liberal intellectuals and activists supported or helped bring about have closed down political democracy, spread corruption, and reversed all the economic achievements of the previous regimes. Indeed, the infighting between secular and Islamist liberals has not been over questions of economic democracy, the right to education and free health care, or redistribution of wealth, but rather about political power in the service of neoliberal economics and over cultural policies. In the meantime, the people of the region have lost all the benefits Arab socialism had brought them, and as a result of the sellout of political democracy by the secular liberals, gained no political or human rights in the interim. The outcome, is a period, the, the outcome is a clear one. Liberalism in the Arab world is not only the enemy of national liberation, it is the discourse that has legitimated its undoing. While national liberation under Arab socialism had freed people from economic dictatorship, poverty, illiteracy, and disease, the new neoliberal regimes and their liberal intelligentsia have freed the Arab people only from Arab socialism and its commitment to national liberation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Masad. Our final speaker for tonight is Dr. Farid Ishaq, and his title is Muslim Societies and Modernity, The Struggle for Liberation and Pluralism. Dr. Ishaq. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening. Um, it's quite 
an achievement to be delivering a coherent talk uh, within uh, 20 minutes. I congratulate the other two speakers for delivering uh, coherent talks. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying anything about them having stuck to or not stuck to their 20 minutes. So if I'm going to be sticking to my 20 minutes, um, I'm afraid I would have to sacrifice some part of the coherence. I'll run through a couple of quick politenesses. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm nice to be in Turkey. Thanks for inviting me. Um, there are a number of colleagues that I'm very happy to see. I see Dr. Nadir Hashimi here. Uh, um, I'm not going to go through all. I see Bruce and Miriam there. And then there's an old uh, worker, co-worker of mine. He's looking at the other side now, uh, Junaid Ahmed, uh, in the audience. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be with lots of old friends and new friends. I had a great meeting up with with uh, other colleagues uh, late last night. Um, <clears throat> I'm meant to be speaking on Muslim scientists and modernity, the struggle for liberation and religious pluralism. I worked through and rushed through my paper. I'm afraid people, um, I can't get to the religious pluralism part. Uh, but you will see where the discourse on religious pluralism fits into what I am saying. My presentation is, has a specific location. I think that uh, if Dr. Al-Aryan and, uh, and his colleagues or henchmen uh, were trying to find three keynote speakers who were going to sing exactly off the same page, um, and uh, you have done uh, very, very well. Uh, there is no need for you to have had three keynote speakers. All three of these people seem to be coming to the same question from the same angle, but just three different locations. Uh, my own location, despite the fact that I come from South Africa, it is actually a very particular phase of a battle that occurred inside the United States and in a more limited uh, period of time and a limited question. Now, some of you will know that I'm pretty known for a book of mine that I wrote about uh, 25 years ago or so, Quran, Liberation, and Pluralism. It's become a bit of a classic. In fact, to my astonishment, um, I received a Turkish translation of the book um, just about a week or two before I came to Turkey. Uh, why anybody would see any wisdom in something that I had written 25 years or longer ago, um, I don't have a clue, but um, or it is perhaps the case of Turkey uh, catching up a little bit later than the rest of the world. Now, that's not something very nice to say. Um, <clears throat> Before I continue, um, <clears throat> you know, very often scholars are seen as the products of their own thinking. That's a myth. We are the product of many, many people who made us. And in this particular presentation, uh, drama which unfolded inside uh, the United States, uh, I often see my students and people who work with me as my uh, collaborators who uh, work with me. Uh, another character who is more recently based uh, in, the, uh, in Turkey, Junaid is sitting at there, doesn't know what's going to come from me, Junaid Ahmed. Um, he was one of the people who collaborated with me uh, in my thinking on this. It was well after I'd written Quran, Liberation, and Pluralism. But the intersection between those ideas and the contemporary discourses on post-coloniality, um, contemporary readings that were happening in the two-third world and so on, uh, contributed an enormous amount to shifting of my own ideas from a narrow-based Islamic liberation theology to an embrace of other currents uh, uh, in, at that time, post-colonial theory and integrating that into my work. And, of course, it enriched my own work uh, enormously. Um, so not only did it enrich my own work, but also in the introduction to a number of scholars whom I am citing here today. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> so this is this book, and uh, Joseph uh, Massad, Professor Massad, you've made the point, you know, on the distinction between liberalism and liberation. I've countless times been introduced as the author of Quran, liberalism, and pluralism. Um, I had a colleague in the United States uh, who taught this work for no less than five courses, and she still spoke about Quran, liberalism, and uh, pluralism. 
So <clears throat> I want to talk about a specific drama that unfolded inside the United States uh, that both uh, Junaid and I were very much in the part of a leadership of around the appropriation of uh, this discourse uh, on liberation in Islam and uh, liberalism. The attack in the United States uh, uh, in 21, not only centered Islam in the Western imagination, but also transported it to the urban centers of power in the West. Changing the spatial dimensions of the narrative, 9-11 brought this volatile and militant entity irrevocably to the Western world. The Western media, military and academic power, wielded by the, the post-9-11 war on terror era, particularly in the United States, did not only mean increased attention to Islam and greater visibility to Muslims, but hitherto unprecedented opportunities to reshape the contours of the faith globally. Now, that understandings of faith and religion are continuously being reformulated is the case with anything connected to humans, and religions are continuously being reformulated, as I said, the case with any humans as historical beings, and this goes without saying. The same applies to the need for such changes, along with our ever-increasing awareness of injustices and the perpetual transmutations and varying guises. Historically, politically, and prophetically speaking, the question thus, is not simply to change or not, but to change in responses to the impulses of the margins and the oppressed, the undersides of society, or in responses to the pressures of the powerful. In the USA, in the, aft the aftermath of 9-11 presented an opportunity for this country and its allies globally to reform Islam by instrumentalizing entirely legitimate grievances amongst Muslims and or others living among them in majority Muslim states. These include the social oppression suffered by Dalit Muslims in India, that of Ahmadi Muslims and Punjabi Christians in Pakistan, to name just two or three examples. While many activists and academics were already working in these areas, the escalated ideologically driven post 9-11 imperialist project unmoored these issues, including the need for religious pluralism inside Muslim communities from the intra-Muslim basis to the reframing and reprioritization as a response to the post 9-11 urgencies and demands of the US empire. Now I zoom in on the contestations for the terms progressive Islam and progressive Muslim as one example of this reimagination and the rearticulation of liberalism and pluralism in a particular context. And as I said, I locate this battle in North America, largely in the US, as a microcosm of the soft war being waged by US led imperialism for the minds and hearts of Muslims. Now, in the late 90s, uh, sometimes when I speak, um, I kind of give, oh my God, is he really that old? But uh, yes, uh, in this case, uh, Junaid, people can look at you and ask, is he really that old? Um, but yes, uh, in the late 90s, while teaching in the US, I joined a collective known as the Network of Progressive Muslims, NPM, uh, in which uh, Junaid played a leading role. My departure from the, term, from the term progressive Muslims occurred after we were defeated in a rather ferocious battle around the employment of this term amongst US Muslim academics and community activists who founded the Progressive Union of North America, I'll refer to them as PAMUNA, in the aftermath of 9-11. Now the existence of this organization was of rather short duration. The debates generated by it were intense, and for a Muslim organization, coverage in the US media, from the New York Times to CNN to the Washington Post to local newspapers, it was immense, unprecedented. Now, if you get that kind of coverage in the USA, positive, something must be wrong with you. 
The issues raised around its formation, both from a more traditional Muslim quarters, as well as from a left perspective, remains pertinent, even more so in the face of the escalation of Islamophobia and the sharpening of imperialist designs on the Muslim world. Now, this earlier NPM <coughs> emerged, was an international Muslim group. It formulated a declaration defining progressive Islam. And the three key drafters of this were Junaid, Naim Jinnah, and myself. But it had serious internationalist uh, input. This declaration was arguably the first serious organizational and international attempt to define progressive Islam. Um, <clears throat> progressive Islam, and I'm quoting now, now, listen carefully, is that understanding of Islam and its sources which come from and is shaped within a commitment to transform society from an unjust one where people are mere objects of exploitation by governments, socioeconomic institutions, and unequal relationships. The new society will be a just one where people are the subjects of history, the shapers of their own destiny, in the full awareness that all of humankind is in a state of returning to God and that the, and that the universe was created as a sign of God's presence. And so there is a centering of the transcendent. As for who we were, we described ourselves as activists and or scholars who have been part of the shaping and articulation of a global Islamic discourse for a number of years. For us, progressive Islam has been about an approach to our faith that is discovered in actual engagement with other Muslims and those who live on the margins of society. Examples, people living with HIV and AIDS, people living under occupation, dying as the victims of multinational corporations, underfunded or non-funded health programs or genocidal regimes. While we have all been working in our local and national context, we have connected with each other for a number of years. And yes, for us, Islam is a faith that affirms justice, compassion, justice first, compassion and diversity. For liberals, it is diversity and compassion. It's the opposite uh, in terms of ranking. It's diversity and compassion. And when it comes to justice, it's a whole lot of charitable stuff that masquerades as justice and that does not reduce the institutional, uh, the institutional dimensions uh, to injustice at all. <clears throat> and then, it is a faith which refuses to exist in partnership or in a relationship of moderation. We refuse to be moderate Muslims alongside injustice and imperialism. And in brackets, of which the most dangerous contemporary kind is that represented by United States expansionism. Now, the post-9-11 battle to civilize the so-called Muslim barbarians was an important stepping stone in the eventual conversion of a radical progressive Islam into a more liberal progressive Islam light. And this LIT word I learned yesterday in Turkey, it's like Pepsi mixed. Yeah? Mixed? Max. Maxed. That Pepsi maxed or max? Oh, it doesn't matter. You know what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> um, so while a much older idea of Islam and Muslims being irredeemable enemies of Western civilization with a newly articulated Judeo-Christian basis persists, immediately after 9-11, Islamophobes found it politically expedient to abandon the blanket demonization of Muslims and instead separate the good Muslim from the bad Muslim and to begin to speak of an intra-Muslim civil war for the soul of Islam. Now... <clears throat> The good Muslim versus the bad Muslim thesis became widespread. But the badness of the bad Muslim was assumed, never the goodness of the good Muslim. The goodness of the, the good Muslim was never to be liberated from the obligation to A, 
tirelessly prove his or her goodness, and by interminable denunciations, whenever any bad Muslim struck anywhere in the Western world, he had to offer ceaseless declarations of loyalty to Western interests and values. The real soul of Islam, true Islam, was now synonymized with Western values. And in the U.S., it was not infrequent that one heard the, op the uh, opinion expressed by the new Muslim moderates that properly considered the message of the Qur'an or the Sharia is identical to that of the U.S. Constitution. So soon after 9-11, this project of creating the good and bad Muslim, the term progressive Muslim became, began to acquire a cuddliness to it. Um, Junaid, in fact, received a telephone call from uh, Gondolisa Rice's office, by no standards of the imagination a progressive entity, received a call from Gondolisa Rice's office asking to meet with me. When he expressed his, uh, uh, why would she want to meet with him? The response was, well, like, isn't he like a, a progressive Muslim? So by now, a progressive Muslim meant essentially two things. Anybody that raised issues with traditional Islam and anybody that was now coming onto the side and joining the United States in its own battle with the Muslim world. So this commencement of this project began to acquire a cuddliness to it. Today it suggests a slightly upmarket, somewhat intellectual approach to Islam with an intellectual and politically correct aura. In the US, the much publicized formation of the short-lived Pamuna um, led to extensive debates in US Muslim circles with significant intervention. Now, the crisis of legitimacy that the traditional and more conservative uh, co community structures faced in the broader U.S. society as a result of September the 11th, spawned and provided the space for several new initiatives, most of them proceeding from the premise that their primary contradiction was with the established Muslim community, and this community was variously presented as backward, fundamentalist, and orthodox. Of course, it was also the newly discovered Beth Noah of the empire Wahhabism. So, the problem was searching for solutions without any critique of their own, and yeah, I'm criticizing North American Muslims now, of their own location as privileged, and a term that I learned again from uh, Junaid, citizens of the empire, which he in turn borrowed from another scholar, uh, um, um, uh, Bob Jensen. Um, so, as privileged citizens of the empire, they were aiding and abetting Muslim dictatorships in perpetuating the very injustices that we were opposing. And secondly, the inability to recognize how the prioritization of reforming Islam and taking on the Muslim community in the absence of a struggle against imperialism and neo-colonialism was effectively playing into the hegemonizing project of the global north and stripping Islam of all of its value as a faith connected both to a revolutionary social project on the one hand and on the other hand umbilically connected to a tradition, to sacred texts and an accountability to a transcendent. I'm, I'll have to skip now, I've seen the note uh, chairperson. Um, so such an Islam is constructed as a manageable set of definitions that can be instrumentally deployed as ideology. Islamist ideology derives less from the lived experience of the believers and is preoccupied with molding a highly utilitarian pseudo-religious project. In such ideology, use value always tr trumps transcendence. Islam as ideology and Islamist faith are not mutually exclusive. They are like two axes on which the state can be plotted. And one way of explaining the difference between the two is, to paraphrase Ashish Nandi, I hope you're not getting tired, whose work was introduced by the same character, to understand ideology as something that its believers constantly need to protect and faith as something its believers constantly expect to protect them. And I'll 
I, I must push towards my conclusion, three minutes. This is because faith always includes a theory of transcendence and usually sanctions an experience of transcendence, whereas ideology is wary of theories and experience of transcendence unless they can be used for some utilitarian purpose. So, for example, in, this, in, in the leadership of this new organization was established, there were people who had declared that we have nothing to do with Islam, that we are atheists, we had walked away from Islam, we are agnostics, uh, the Islamic tradition, Islamic beliefs means nothing to us. And they were included in the leadership of this progressive Muslims of North uh, America. So <clears throat> both moderate as well as the new progressive Muslims begin with the assumption that positive change cannot come about from within Muslim communities themselves, but involve a necessary dependence on either the more enlightened empire or the more enlightened cultural Muslim the cultured intellectual who has been educated and located in the West. Um, here I am at my last paragraph, Dr. Ariane, and it's not too long a paragraph, and it is, okay, time Romans font 10. So one, two, one key difference between the two approaches was that unlike uh, <clears throat> this light Islam, <clears throat> for us, the primacy that for this light Islam, the primacy of the political and accountability to the transcendent was absent. Decolonial Muslim theorist Salman Sayed, I think he's now Junaid supervisor, um, <clears throat> argues from a post foundational philosophical position that counter hegemonic critical Muslim projects must center the political which is closely tied with the ontological and not politics, the ontic. Now, I would say that the Islamic approach is to first define what the political social order is ontologically a priori and how to change the social order from this vantage point. And this is in contradistinction, in contradistinction to a more liberal ontic approach which accepts the social order as a given and attempts to alter it through changing the ontic politics of a much wider political ontology. So for Sayyid then, defining social difference is fundamental, with the primary social ontological difference being the conditions of coloniality, being that of the West over the rest, and more specifically in relation to Muslims, the West over Islam. This means that a critique of the West must be primal, as it is the political organizing principle which already predefines any Muslim attempt at reforming it. And in overlooking the primacy of the political ontological differences that Western supremacy creates as their first contradiction in their reform struggle, liberal progressive reformers can only deal with the politics of Muslim reform, and this does not engage at all in any radical questioning of the social order from a counter-hegemonic positionality. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Ishaq, and thank you for our uh, three panelists for uh, very thought-provoking speeches. I was supposed to engage with 10-minute discussion because of the time. I'll try to merge my questions later, so I'm going to open it up uh, for the audience because we have to finish in about uh, less than 30 minutes. So I'll go ahead and take three people from this uh, side, three from here and three from here, you have up to 90 seconds to state either a comment or a question. So if you'd like to, uh, whoever would like to start, please raise your hands. And we have people with a microphone. Yes, uh, can you give the microphone right here? Yes. Yes, yeah, well, it's up to you, but make sure the microphone is on. If you like, please. It's not on. Can you have the microphone on, please? Where's the other microphone? No. Can you give the other microphone? <laughs> 
Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is um, Ilhan Kagri in the United States, Ilhan Chara in Turkey. Um, I work for the Muslim Public Affairs Council, which is an advocacy organization for American Muslims in the United States. Um, thank you for this conference, and uh, thank you for the speakers. They were wonderful. I have two questions. One is for Dr. Massad, who asked about, who talked about Egypt, and I really found uh, your presentation, uh, you know, very concise and, and um, interesting. The question I had about Egypt, and you can just give a brief answer, is it seems to me that Egypt today is now broken up into two states. One is a military state, and uh, has a, it has a military economy, has its own stores, its own housing, and then there's the, you know, non-military, everybody else kind of thing. Um, and the reason that Sisi has the control that he has is because the people that are aligned with the military, this big burgeoning group of people, support him because that's where they get their livelihood from. So where did that start from? Where, where, where's the beginning, the roots of that? The second question for you is, um, when the Muslim Brotherhood came into power, why did they pick such a person as um, Morsi, who was so weak? I mean, was there nobody else to be a leader uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood? I think that that might have been a big mistake. And then the final question is for Dr. Isak, and that is, um, I'm going to play, ask you a devil's advocate question. And when you, I loved your definition of progressive Muslims, but it seems to me that that's just a definition of being a Muslim. So that's what Islam, that's what the Quran tells us to do, you know, be just. 80% of the Quran is about social justice. So why is it that uh, the Muslims felt compelled to put an adjective? Why didn't they call themselves fundamentalist Muslims and say, yeah, we're just going back to the Quran and we're just, we're going to be doing social justice. Thank you very Thank you. much. That was a question I was going to raise, so it's great. It's been raised by the audience. Um, let's see. Anybody from this side? Okay, always. Quickly, please. Uh, my, na my name is Awais Khan. Uh, thank you for the panelists for your brilliant insights. Uh, my question was that uh, it seems like from the two earlier talks, uh, by Professor Mossad and Professor Berktai, that Islamists face a very specific challenge, which is what to do about nationalism and what to do about liberalism. Because it seems like both of these challenges aren't adequately responded, to, haven't been, there hasn't been an adequate response by Islamism, so, or Islamists. My question is, is that, is that a challenge that only Islamists face, or is that a challenge that generally all political actors in the field face? Or is there some kind of very specific uh, uh, fault of Islamist actors on those two major questions? Thank you. Thank you. The site? Anybody on that side? Okay, let me switch on this side. Okay, do I? I think that was a brilliant presentation for the three of you. Enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm going to address my question to Professor uh, Masad. Although probably the implication for the others, I didn't want to have three questions. Because it seems to me that um, you had a 3,000 feet view of the dynamics of the region. And I would like to get the clarification from you because it seems to me that you were either denying that there were some cultural issues that at stake in terms of why these Arab societies have been suffering the, the, the, the, the, the fate that they have been suffering. Um, you seem to um, sort to feel comfortable with this um, um, Nasser regime and the early socialist regime, as you said. The, the um, he called I, I like the, the, the, the, the you know the description. These are state capitalist regimes, which is probably a better you know a better description. But but then you know uh, it seems to me that you you, you looked at the, that period as a good period, and then what came after it as something has nothing to do with it, as if that the the missteps of Nasser himself or uh, whoever ruled Syria or other Arab countries. Um, of course, Syria ruled by generals every two years there was a, a, a coup d'etat, as you know. But there was social issues, there were cultural issues, and I think they remain the, the, the, the, the puzzle, I mean, the, the most important central part of the puzzle. So what would you say about that? I mean, don't you think that 
there is a need to undertake this cultural reformation, which, is clear. which without, without that, nothing could happen on the surface. Okay, Shinar. Thank you. Is it on? Speak loud, yeah. Couldn't one reframe that binary as liberalism versus democracy? Because many people, I mean, this is a critical comment not uh, to, to rephrase it, because uh, when, uh, at least as outsiders, when we look at the drama in Egypt with Morsi in jail and Muslim Brotherhood uh, banned, uh, similar episodes earlier in Algeria, to a certain extent Tunisia and Syria, it seems like uh, many liberals, self-identified liberals, English-speaking li liberals writing in the U.S., in England, etc., implicitly or explicitly justified the overthrow. So the bigger chasm doesn't, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, seems more like Western liberals, but also the very Arab socialists that uh, you have spoken fondly about on the one side in favor of some sort of minority rule, whether it is Arab socialism or Western liberalism, versus the larger you know, political organizations and masses who favor electoral democracy. So you said, so isn't, I mean, the, the current situation more liberalism versus even the most basic level of electoral democracy as opposed to the, is, was this unclear? I mean, Thank you. I think your question it is clear. Thank it, you. it is clear. Okay. Anybody on the side? Okay, let me switch the one in the back. Yes. It's not on. Yeah, something. It's a problem with this microphone. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome to our university and my question for Halil Bergtai. Um I would like to ask you a question which is, uh, don't take it, take it personally because uh, I'm just trying to understand the uh, con concept what you tell us. Um, basically you talked about uh, Omar Saifuddin and um, Mehmet Akif Arso, but you had a specific point which is um, debatable in the Mehmet Akif's poetry. Uh, he also wrote about the uh, uh, praises of Pro Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Umar Saifuddin, which we know that uh, founded by the Turkish nationalists. So he wrote, he wrote the, this kind of things from the um, some perspective, which is, um, I think it was the pressure of, um, of the, the area. Uh, we know that as well the Namik Kemal Ziyago Kalp uh, of the, the, any other Turkish nationalist, they wrote from the government. So, like, uh, can we just, um, how can we um, judge them from the specific example? Because also we know that uh, we cannot judge the poetry or the novelist from the, uh, their, um, their books, because like uh, if, if I give an example from the Ismet Azal uh, of not being a Jew, he says that um, this is the Turkish Yehudi değil sen bile bende Yehudalık yok mu? Kime öptüm de kurtuldu çarmıha çakılmaktan. So can we say that uh, is he uh, supporting the Jewish or he is feeling that he is Jewish, which is um, which is is Islamic writer, uh, Islamic poet. So this is my question that okay. isn't it uh, saying, uh, giving the example uh, of specific example unfair for the understanding them like okay. it seemed a bit unfair point because like we have to show the the big picture like because we have plenty of scholars in here. Thank you very much. Okay, we got two Thank more. You. Am I missing anybody? Are there any hands up? Okay, let me add my two cents here uh, for Dr. Berktai. Uh, if we want to project what you said to uh, what we have today at present, do we have Turkish identities or, or, or an identity that can? Because people say that what shapes Turkish identity is Ottomanism, nationalism, Turkish nationalism, Islamism. Do we have that all three together or do we have it identities where we have some sort of a conflict uh, uh, today? And for, for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Masad, you know, regarding uh, 
the accomplishments and achievements of Arab, national, uh, Arab socialism, at least during the Nasser era, uh, with all the achievements that you, you cited, uh, could that be sacrificed? Or the, could that, is that, when, when people talk about the repression that these regimes have, have imposed on, on big segments and great segments of society, and when people try to talk about freedom and democracy, these are not necessarily liberal values, because when people would like express themselves and live where they can have a part of decision making. So how you can reconcile uh, these two in light of the Arab Spring? Obviously, you know, a lot of people would agree with you in terms of the economic models that some of the people who have risen against these, these regimes, that these were not uh, models that could actually uh, be more of a popular, this more of the elites. And finally, for the Dr. Isaac, Ishaq, this is about the progressives. Why did we have, I mean, somebody asked that, why do we have to use that adjective? But also, in light of the uh, RAND report, you know, where they would talk about secular, you know, the least of all Muslims, progressive, conservative, Salafists, and which is part, really, of an imperialist project. And they said, we can't turn Muslims into secularists, but perhaps we need to, to champion progressives, and that's how I understand Condoleezza Rice's phone call to Junaid, you know, they were trying to latch into this particular uh, progressive Muslims where they can uh, uh, put aside what is called traditional uh, teachings of Islam. Uh, but, you know, in terms of putting justice as the central theme is certainly something that has not been, unfortunately, to many Muslim movements, but at the same time, you don't want to replace that with what is traditional about Islam. So perhaps you can address issues. What I have now is basically four minutes for each speaker, and then we'll conclude. Dr. Berktai. I'm not sure I understand one of them. Um, let me begin with the last. Uh, I have a dirty, filthy, contaminated, polluted view of history and of human individuals. I don't think there is any such thing as Weberian ideal types in terms of human beings. For that matter, identities. Ideologies and identities interact, crisscross, overlap, uh, there is no purity, they borrow from each other. And this brings me uh, to one question from over there. Uh, we've been talking about challenges from liberalism or from nationalism to Islam. Is this specific to Islam or is it general? I would say it's absolutely general. Here at this conference, we just happen to be trying to look at things from the vantage point of Islam but we could switch this around. We could be talking about challenges to nationalism, challenges to socialism, challenges to this, that, etc. And then from a different vantage point, we would be witnessing the same overlaps, the same compromises, the same attempts to subordinate, to assimilate, etc. I, uh, I think this is how politics happen. Uh, with regard to Turkey at present, are there, does Turkish identity, is it a melange, is it a hybrid of all three, or are there three distinct identities? My answer would be these are not mutually exclusive. That is to say, all of them exist. Um, uh, certainly, I would say, uh, a certain kind of authoritarian, laicist, Kemalist, modernist identity is probably relatively more sectarian and relatively more self-enclosed than any of the others. But I would say that uh, with regard to especially Turkish nationalism and Islam, there are virtually everybody, well, uh, contains elements of both. This is the vast majority of society. There may be relatively stronger nationalists and relatively stronger Muslims, but again, we have this entire spectrum with the further proviso that everything is in flux all the time. Um, let me remind you of uh, what happens 
after, that's to say, after my presentation ended. Um, I would, um, I don't think I'm being unfair to uh, Mehmet Akif. Humans, another aspect of humans is that they are not necessarily consistent. That is to say, they have different forces pulling them in this direction and that direction at uh, different times. And sometimes somebody like Mehmet Akif comes across as a very strong and profound kind of deeply entrenched, deeply enracinated uh, in Islamic faith kind of intellectual and poet. And at other times, faced with other challenges, he is willing to make this or that kind of compromise. And you cannot really, from anybody's biography, you can select quotations at different times, which, as part of the big picture, might appear self-contradictory. And that is probably very really the case. Uh, I'm speaking of a particular conjuncture in which Mehmed Akif was, and I'm going to put it very strongly, he was willing to become Ömer Seyfeddin's radiant and venerable Hoca Efendi sitting in one corner of the compartment. This is what, this is the agenda in his Gallipoli hymn, and this is the agenda in his national anthem. The national anthem represents the mass mobilization ideology it is the iconic text, for a very good reason, of the national struggle. Because it embodies the historically momentary and ephemeral alliance for that time between the modernist Turkish nationalists and the Islamists, or the Muslim patriots, as Zürcher would put it, of the time. What happens afterwards? Well, after victory, the modernist nationalists think that they have achieved their objectives and that Islam has provided them with enough mass support in terms of the ideology embodied in the national anthem. And now they are in power and they don't really need popular Islam anymore. They, the alliance, the grand alliance breaks up they go their different ways. Kemalism establishes itself in power. And Mehmed Akif, paradoxically, goes into self-exile in Egypt while the nation continues singing his national anthem. Uh, these are the complexities of history. I do think that, and I do think that the search of this authoritarian developmentalist Turkish nationalist ideology that we refer to as first unionism, Ittihadism, and then Kemalism has not ended to this day. This is Kemalist modernizations or unionist modernizations version of looking for a progressive Islam. Is it receding? Hmm? Is it receding? Uh, it is partly receding for obvious political developments, but I do think that it is there. It is profoundly there. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't think we have seen the end of it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Masad. Thank you for the questions. Um, uh, I mean, I spoke about the Arab world. I gave more examples about Egypt specifically because that's sort of the uh, uh, more salient case. Um, to begin with, well, no, I mean, Egypt does not have two segments of the economy. There, it has a capitalist neoliberal economy, a large sector of which, or a large section of which, is owned by the military. But, you know, corporate uh, uh, and individual businessmen, whether in Egypt or uh, corporate uh, corporations, uh, transnational corporations from across the world, especially from the U.S., uh, individual South. Saudi or Emirati investors, etc., are all involved in this. So the economy is a neoliberal economy with the state sector completely uh, retracting in, in, in, in large measure from most of the services it used to provide. Um, and uh, so in that sense, I just see it as you know, one 
uh, sector. That is, it's a for-profit neoliberal sector that wants the state to contract and to uh, limit, if even uh, continue to provide uh, state services to the population, including, of course, issues such as price subsidies and what have you. As far as who the uh, Muslim Brothers chose in Egypt, of course, they wanted Khaira the Shatir, who was banned from running, and therefore they had to rely on uh, Morsi. Uh, Shatir was, you know, would have been the, uh, of course, more uh, uh, extreme neoliberal businessman who wanted more extreme neoliberal economic policies to be put in uh, in place. Um, uh, Morsi followed a sort of a, a similar agenda. Uh, there were others, of course, that were centrists in the Muslim Brotherhood economic that they were not, were not chosen, uh, such as Abu al-Futuh, for example, who had left. Um, the liberalism is a challenge to uh, uh, sort of Muslims and different forms of Islamists as it is elsewhere, as I've tried to say that basically, just like the discourse of national liberation was not only an Arab or Muslim one, but what it was a global one in the colonized world, also liberalism and neoliberalism are sort of the new de rigueur ideologies across Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So they're not only limited to Muslims and Islam uh, uh, in that sense. They sh but, but of course, the challenge remains that what you, what you have today as a, as a political discourse that is hegemonic across uh, the Muslim world, but specifically, of course, in the Arab world, but you see this in Africa and in Latin America. But in the Muslim world, you have two kinds, basically, either the secular liberals who support neoliberalism or the Islam Islamist liberals. These are the more uh, dominant discourses within the different uh, uh, wings of Islamist movements and secularist movements, I think, in, in, in both cases. The question of the cultural issues, um, no. I mean, the thing is, there is a historic change. Before 1967, much of the analysis of the problems of the, the colonial world, especially also in the Arab world and the Muslim world, were always phrased in economic developmental terms, right? Suddenly, after 1967, um, secular and even formerly socialist uh, intellectuals began to articulate this as a culturalist aspect, either being too Muslim, and it should, uh, either Islam would have liberated us and the Arabs have ruined Islam, or Islam itself is the problem, and this is the reason why the socialist experiments actually failed. I mean, the, the, the famous book by Sadiq Jalal al uh, uh, on Al-Naqd uh, al Bad al Hazima, or Auto Critique After uh, the Defeat, which I usually dub uh, uh, self uh, hatred after the critique, or Al Kurh al Dhati Bad al Hazima, is mostly articulated in the sense that it's Arab Christianity and Arab Islam that have been the problem. Um, and that have, in fact, uh, been the bane of the existence of Arab socialism and explain its failure. No, I don't think they were cultural issues in the sense that what is defined as culture is uh, a problem here. The, the, the, uh, I mean, this has a 19th century history, a European history. Um, I wrote a book called uh, uh, uh, Desiring Arabs, where I try to show that much of what Arab intellectual production has been since the 19th century is, in fact, autocritique, constantly self-flagellation that all all the so-called failures of the Arab world in terms of development, economic achievement, or so-called political democracy can be attributed to Arab culture or Islam. So, and this is, of course, what the Arab liberals today, the secular liberals, insist on doing, saying, let us factor out imperial ventures. Let us factor out the role of Israel in the region. Everything should be blamed on the cultural question. The reason why today most Arab countries are not democratic is actually cultural, they tell us. That the reason why they have not uh, developed economically is cultural. I think um, there's a history to where the cultural arguments came to be presented as the most important ones, which begins after 1967. The Islamist liberals, like the secular liberals, would, part would partake of this heavily and participate in this even if the answers they provide are different than the ones that are provided by the secular liberals. But I do think um, I am less interested in um uh, uh, uh, what cultural factors led to the defeat in 67, and more interested in historicizing the explanation itself of how it came to dominate our understanding of what happened um, in 67. Um, there was a question about um, uh, liberalism today versus democracy. Is that how I? 
Okay. Um, so the, the question of liberalism versus democracy. No, I think liberalism is always Western liberalism. And democracy is always coined as political democracy. I don't understand why economic democracy is not on the agenda. So for me, a lot of the people who believe in political democracy have no problem with economic dictatorship. I am interested in pursuing why economic democracy is not on the agenda uh, uh, today and only so-called political or electoral forms of democracy are presented. Uh, finally, the question of political repression under Arab socialism. No, no, of course, I am very bothered by it. The question for me is now the Arab socialist experiment, whatever that meant, between you know, the 50s and the 80s, the early 80s, is presented only in terms of the political repression it had put, uh, uh, uh, put out and it had uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, committed. And this is the same kind of political repression that continues after it ended. So in that sense, what was positively achieved, which was economic development, uh, uh, the elimination of poverty, education, etc. All of that has also been reversed, and political repression continues, right? Which is which gives more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, uh, weight to the culturalist argument, saying, "See, when, you know, whenever things change in the Arab world, they actually don't. It's all about uh, the lack of political democracy, which you know we can discuss separately." Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Isha. Uh, I'll be. I'll try to be quick. Uh, first of all, uh, the the question of adjectivizing uh, Islam. Um, it's not a new problem, uh, really. Um, I mean, both uh, in, uh, in Aqidah, in Muslim dogmatics, and in fiqh, um, adding qualifiers has been pretty much uh, the standard. Whether these qualifiers were pejorative, say uh, the Khawarij, or say uh, describing the, uh, the Hanafis, uh, um, this has been uh, <clears throat> fairly common, or, or more affirmatively, the Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Uh, we are Sunni Muslims, so there's nothing unusual in the tradition of Islam. And then there has, of course, always been contestations, not always uh, takfir, but there's always been contestations about, you know, the things, the Hanaf the position versus the Hanabila, and, and, and. Um, uh, ideologically, I think that uh, in the 20th century, um, it often became in different kinds of political struggles more important for Muslims to also uh, define themselves. Uh, but be just before I come to that, um, one of the virtues, and I'm not saying it should be an acceptable virtue, one of the virtues of actually uh, adjectivizing one's expression of Islam uh, is also a statement that, uh, that this is not uh, the only kind of Islam. There is a certain kind of totalitarianism, I think, uh, that comes with uh, uh, this is my understanding of Islam, and my understanding of Islam is synonymous with Islam. My approach to Islam, my, um, and then you know you end up with a pretty little uh, you and your little you and you, your, your friends who are. So it leads to that uh, kind of logic. Very quickly, the genesis of this whole thing. I mean, there's been a large. Uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, background uh, or genealogical uh, history to the use of progressive inside the Muslim world with various connotations. Uh, for us inside South Africa, and we had our own origins in the Islamic movement, uh, that is uh, the Jamaat Islami and the and Ikhwan, um, and uh, we self described as progressive Islamists. Um, by progressive, we indicated our, because in the South African context, progressive was a part of the left, the broad international left. So we described, self described as progressive Islamists, and those are uh, this particular tendency in South African Islam were people who were organically involved in and committed, very deeply committed, uh, as religious and practicing Muslims. Um, in the struggle for what we described as a non-racial and a non-sexist and uh, new South Africa, and working alongside with non-Muslims, and this is in some ways why uh, my book, Quran, Liberation and Pluralism, is based on the argument that the Quran supports religious pluralism, 
but a pluralism disconnected from the bourgeois liberal celebrations in letting a thousand flowers bloom, whether these flowers are poisonous or whether they contribute uh, to, the, to the sustainable kind of uh, ecosystem. So it had its genesis there. But finally, it's a term that um, it follows me like a bad penny, um, but it is a term that I am that I have distanced myself from, but arguably not fast enough, uh, not adequately enough. So I continue to be, uh, with a lot of respect and affection for the scholarly value of many other people who are connected to this project. I do think that the huge failure is precisely this cultural and theological thing, that if we sort out our theology, everything will be okay. If we sort out the cultural images of Muslims as the bad guys, everything will be okay. Another version or dimension to the same talk uh, that was delivered by uh, the colleague on my, on my left, but physical right. Professor Massad. Thank you. Thank you so much for all our three speakers for this enlightening discussion. As you know, this is only the beginning of the discussion. This discussion will go on for the next uh, two days. I also would like to acknowledge some of our guests in the audience, Dr. Bruce Lawrence and Dr. Miriam Cook from Duke University. <laughs> Dr. Munzab Qahir, who was here earlier. Uh, obviously, he was connected to the Hamad bin Khalifa, and now he is part and parcel of our faculty here in the Economics Department and Islamic Finance. Uh, uh, we also have Dr. Muhammad Makram and Dr. Nusuh Uslu, who is the Vice President, who just joined. We have Tariq Chilling, and we have Fatih Okumush, and we have delegations from the following countries. You know, we have delegations here in the conference from Algeria, India, Kashmir, Qatar, Kuwait, Palestine, Pakistan, and Malaysia. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, after we conclude, you know, those people go and, and pray, but after that we have dinner. You know, the, our president here is hosting dinner for the speakers and for the special guests, which will be in the museum area. The hosts will, will walk you there, so please uh, join us for us. Before we conclude, we have uh, certificates, if you might. Joseph, I'm, I'm Dr. Khalil not saying so to be nice, but I've been a very warm and ardent admirer of your work. Thank you, you, you very are much. most kind, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very so much for your work. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, it's not something that I enjoy, but I still have to smile for it. Dr. Joseph Massad. Zoom tomorrow, 9.30, in this hallway. Please be here on time. And our first panel will be the challenge of sectarianism. Thank you very much. <laughs>